Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome to this section on language. So, <clears throat> at the very brief uh, outset of this section, let me ask the question what is language or rather another question what is it that we are doing right now. Now, when this lecture is progressing as I am talking to you, what we are doing is we are exchanging ideas and knowledge between them. So, I am imparting some knowledge, I am imparting some ideas which you are uh, grabbing. And so, the medium through which these ideas that I am imparting, uh, it, uh, it emanates from me and it is received by you is through language. So, language basically is a medium of communication, it is it's that medium or it is that thing which helps two people talk to each other or two people to communicate with each other. Now, look at the uh, title of this slide. As you can see, the first part of it is in English and the second part of it is in German. And so, what German say, uh, German part says is, Entschuldigung sprechen die English, which basically means, uh, excuse me, can you speak English? I am a much famous uh, thing or a much famous word that I used to use when I was uh, uh, res, uh, research associate in Berlin, in Charité Berlin. Uh, what this means is that I used to often go around talking people, talking to people and asking them whether they could speak English. And so, uh, why I would do that? I would do that because there was some problems in communication. I was not able to put forward my idea and so, this is a form or this is basically um, a way in German to ask if the next person that you meet knows English or not without uh, ever uh, disregarding them in some way. So, basically what language is, it is a medium or it is a channel of passing information from the sender to a receiver. And uh, that is very important in cognitive psychology, because uh, anything in cognitive psychology, any cognitive processes, uh, any cognitive uh, function has to have a language for, from through which uh, things can be communicated. And uh, for to start, uh, you can see that uh, the person in his soup, but then the way he is uh, up the language and so he says there is a soup in communication or languages although they are a medium of communication but they have to follow certain rules and if, to, if you do not follow these rules what really happens is that the whole meaning of the sentence is lost so let's then start with uh, the meaning of language so what is language and how is it different from communication so basically is language the only uh, medium of communication is the language the only medium of transferring information between two objects one a sender the other is a receiver or maybe others are receiver and if they are then how is language different from communication now there are several uh, communication systems out there in the world for example microwave communication it doesn't have a fixed language or uh, the uh, smoke dance that you see or the honey bee dance that honey bees uh, do when they find uh, honey uh, across certain flowers or uh, certain sign languages out there and these mediums are a medium of communication but they are not language why they are not language because the, the language has certain uh, fixed uh, rules or certain fixed characteristics which most communication mediums do not. For example, one rule is that in communication only brief number of ideas can be transferred and fixed number of ideas can be transferred and so new ideas cannot be generated. For example, if the smoke signal says that intruder is coming, uh, that is what it could do. But language on the other hand 
can be used can be uh, 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 used to form new uh, uh, signs or new information that can be transferred. And so, the fly is in the uh, uh, the soup is in the fly or fly is in the soup may mean two different things. The soup is in the fly which basically means the fly has drunk in the soup whereas, the fly is in the soup means that the soup has a fly and so two different things the fly can have the soup and so it will be somewhere in the stomach assuming that the fly has a stomach. In the other case the soup being uh, the fly being in the soup has a different connotation altogether which basically means that this is non eatable something which is contaminated and cannot be eaten. So, basically then uh, language is often used as a communication system, uh, but and as I explained to you there are other communications or systems also there which are not true languages and we will see why language is different from the communication system. And so, some of the communication systems out there are like honey bee dances, smokes from mountain, bird songs uh, and so many other things. Now, what is the difference between a communication system and a language? A natural language has to have four properties. First of all, it a natural language is regular, which basically means that it is governed by certain rules which are called grammar. So, certain rules tells uh, the language what should be interpreted and what should not be interpreted and so what are the anomalies and how the anomalies occur and how it can be correct. Also, a natural language is productive, which means that it a uh, natural language can produce infinite combinations, a number of communication, a number of ideas. So, change something into a language, same some part of a language, a new language, uh, a new idea is generated. Also, it is to be a natural language is arbitrary. What does it mean? Uh, lack of a necessary resemblance between the word and a sentence, which means basically means what a word tells and what a sentence tells or what is the meaning of a word and what is the meaning of a sentence are completely different. So, any word in a sentence could mean uh, differently as against what a word would mean. So, a bank would mean a bank but I was standing on the river bank means something else. So, here the meaning of the bank changes whereas, a uh, bank could mean anything in terms of financial institution or a river bank, but when I put the same bank into a uh, uh, sentence like can I bank on you in this case the idea of a financial institution is not what uh, is talked about. And so, arbitrariness basically means that words the meaning of words and the meaning of sentences are totally arbitrary and there is no one to one relationship between them. Also, a natural language should be discrete the which basically means that I can take up a sentence and I can divide it into certain meaningful parts. So, so that I can study the sentence. So, discreteness is a system or it is a basically a property where uh, the sentences can be divided or the meaningful sentences can be divided into recognizable parts. So, that uh, I can understand what is the role of a part in a whole sentence and that is what a uh, language or any characteristic of a language should be and this is how it differs from a communication. Now, what is the structure of a language? Any language what is the structure of it? Now, languages have a number of system which works together and uh, evaluating a language requires the study of conversations. Uh, it is basically exchange of ideas between two people. So, when two people talk if we study that we will be able to understand what a language is. So, basically conversations are uh, uh, are round around or they are revol they revolve around listening and perceiving the sounds of the speaker. So, it is not just listening the sound of a speaker what somebody is saying conversations also employ an idea of you should be able to understand what the speaker is saying. So, uh, this is the difference between listening and understanding. Now, different languages have different sounds called the phonemes. So, uh, phoneme is basically a speech sound. So, each language has a different kind of a sound and this basic sound that each language has for example, ba, da and sa are called the phonemes. Now, the study in which the phonemes these basic sounds of a language for example, in, in Hindi it could be a, u, e kind of a thing which are uh, the vowels in Hindi. Uh, the swar as we call them uh, or ka 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 as it when and we call them or in English it is a e i o u which is the vowel or uh, a b c d e f which is uh, a uh, c d e f kind of a consonant in English. 
so they produce a sound for example the a sound has two phonemes into it or two phones into it the uh, a and the e when we say a it has a and e into it and so these are the phonemes basic speech sounds so the study in which the phoneme these speech sounds are combined uh, in any given language is called the phonology so basically conversation is listening to and perceiving what other people say and that can be done by identifying the basic speech sounds the basic phones that each language has and these phones are the primary phones or the primary sounds which the language has and as I explained to you in the English language for example, the word A has the A plus E sound right and so these are the two sounds the R sound and the E sound so A as, as you say. Now, the various phonemes are these basic sounds of A and E are combined together to use uh, to yell a meaningful unit of a language which is called a morphology. So, the A and E then combine together to form A A which then combines with some other uh, uh, sounds for example, uh, A T E which is 8 or A P P L E which is apple and this is called morphology. So, phonemes are combined together to your meaningful uh, words which are basically called the morphemes. So, uh, these morphemes are generally not word, but part of a word right. So, um, uh, for example, morphemes are uh, things like word endings example making plurals. So, if I uh, a p p l e and if I add a, a s this s which is add to apple to make it a plural is called a morpheme. Uh, similarly, prefixes, tenses, markers for example, tense markers like for present continuous tense I use markers like i n g or for past continuous I use tense markers like id, uh, he walked, he is walking, he uh, he will be walking kind of a thing or he walked. So, when I say the e, e, e d to walk it gets convert into a uh, past tense and so basically these are the morphemes. Now, uh, some of the morphemes the smallest meaningful units of a language are words that need to be identified in order to study the role behind uh, each word in a sentence. So, basically then think of it in this way each conversation a language starts with identifying the basic speech sound which is called the phonemes and these phonemes or basic phones as I said A has two phonemes A and E these phones combine together to form a meaningful unit for example, a morpheme. A morpheme uh, is basically a combination of uh, phones which has some meaning for example, E D in terms of uh, uh, the word ending or I N G in terms of word ending or uh, things like uh, prefixes uh, for example, uh, um, uh, any any prefix. So, fulfill unfulfilled kind of a thing. So, un here or in here kind of prefixes which turns the change the meaning of a sentence these are called morphemes and these morphemes are then governed by certain rule or governed by certain structure which is called the syntax. So, basically the structure of a language is in terms of the basic speech sounds which is called the phonemes at another level with the fun phonemes combined together is another level which is called the morpheme which is a collection of phonemes, but which has some meanings or which has some uh, meaningful unit of a sentence. Now, these morphemes could be anything in terms of word endings, in terms of sentence markers, in terms of uh, uh, critical parts of a sentence and so on and so forth. And these morphemes are then guided by certain structure which is called the syntax. So, syntax is basically the structure of a sentence. Now, a syntactically correct sentence does not itself is always good conversation. So, basically saying that all the objects or all the morphemes or all the correct phonemes or if it has a sentence, if a sentence has the right structure or the right syntax, it may make meaning, it may not make meaning. For example, look at the uh, first sentence that we saw the soup is in the fly. Now, probably or not probably basically this sentence has a right syntax is everything correct in terms of the object, the subject, the verb everything is in line, but it makes no meaning because the soup cannot be in the fly in terms of the context. Although soup is in the fly basically means that the fly has drunk in the soup, but looking at a restaurant scenario where you see a person taking a soup and then there is a bowl and the bowl there is a uh, there is a fly which is onto it some things um, basically proves wrong. So, looking at the context the sentence is wrong and that is what I am trying to tell here that 
every syntactically correct uh, correct sentence may not be right. Now, the sentence must mean something to uh, the listener and in this in the first case the sentence was not meaning anything and so this meaning which is generated by a sentence of syntactically or of a grammatically I uh, am um, sorry not grammatically in terms of structurally correct sentence is called the semantics. So, semantics is the study of meaning of a sentence when you so basically then in a sentence you have the phones which are the basic speech sounds take these phones combine together you will find found the morphemes which are uh, small critical units of a sentence for example, it could be word ending, it could be tense markers, it could be anything and these morphemes then combine together in a certain specific form to form the level of the word and these words are then governed by certain rules which is called the syntax. Now, syntax is how should you write a sentence, but then the uh, syntactically correct sentence in terms of rules if a sentence is correct it may have a meaning or it may not have a meaning and so this idea whether the sentence has a meaning or a not meaning is called the study of semantics. So, look at this here uh, there is a sentence that I have used and I will show you the basic parts of it. So, the sentence here is the stranger talk to the players and so let us break this sentence into its parts. So, the first level from the sentence down is the phrase level and in the phrase level you can see there are two phrases into it we have the noun phrase and the verb phrase. The verb phrase is the phrase what is a phrase? A phrase is a collection of uh, uh, words in a sentence which makes complete meaning right. For example, if I say the strangers it has some meaning into it and so it does not need anything beside it. Also I say talk to the players. So, although there is a question who talk to the players, but just by itself talk to the players has certain meaning and so phrases are uh, parts of a sentence or combination of a sentence which has complete meaning. And so at the level of the uh, at the phrase I have a non phrase and a verb phrase. At the level of the word then again uh, breaking this sentence uh, I have two words the and strangers and then at the level of the word on this side on the noun phrase I have talked to the players four words to look at. Similarly, at the level of the morpheme I have the strange and ers because strange is the word root word and ers makes a number of words. So, strangers and similarly here talk is the word which is the core word and ed is the uh, marker sentence marker talk. So, it is past, past tense and similarly in two the play e r n s players which means uh, the plural of it and then coming to the level of the phoneme. So, this is the level of the phoneme how the is stranger is spelled here and s is spelled and so on and so forth. So, basic basic uh, 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 structure of any language is it starts with phoneme goes to morpheme which is combination of phonemes then it goes to the level of the word where morphemes combine together to form words which are meaningful units and these words are then converted into uh, or uh, mixed up using syn uh, syntax using uh, language rules uh, to make phrases and these phrases then form the sentence and the sentence then is looked for or is thought of in terms of meaning which is called the semantics. Now, for conversations to work there must be some flow. So, any conversation which, which happens between two people for any conversation to happen there should be a flow between uh, uh, the movement of the sentence. So, listeners must not only so listeners of a, of a language or listeners of uh, uh, a particular conversation should not only pay attention and make certain assumptions the speaker must also craft their contribution in what the uh, ways in which the listeners uh, uh, which makes the job uh, of the listener feasible. For example, think of this sentence. So, somebody says I want a red watch and the other person says yes, yes uh, the NASA is sending a rocket. Now, in this way what is happening is the two people are talking together and so one person has no meaning it is not making any meaning although two people are making sentences uh, conversations, but these conversations are not being interpreted and so for conversation to work uh, listeners must pay attention not only pay attention to what is being uh, said, but the speaker of a sentence should make sure that whatever he is saying should be crafted or should be made in such a way that the listener understands it. If you say an incomprehensible sentence the stranger may not understand the listener may not understand it and so conversation is a two part game where there is a speaker and where there is a listener. So, the speaker should pay attention the, uh, the uh, listener should pay attention the speaker should make sentences in a way which is comprehensible and that is how conversation flows. Now, the aspect of a language this aspect of language which basically decides what a speaker should say and how a listener should look into it is called the pragmatics. So, although meaningful sentences although semantics is the meaning of a sentence, but just having 
having meaning a sentence is does not itself make a conversation. So, for a conversation to flow you should have something called pragmatics into it which basically is that how conversations or how things are shared between people. What is it? Uh, how is a listener listening to something and what is being transmitted by the sender. So, prag pragmatics is the flow of conversation, the kind of uh, flow of conversation between a speaker and a listener, the idea of how conversation should happen, how a good conversation should happen is what is called the pragmatics. Beside this, there is something called grammar which are sets of rules for a language. Now, grammar has nothing to do with, uh, with the rules of a good, gram uh, good language. For example, if I say the word no, uh, I ain't coming. Now, if I say I ain't coming, ain't is not a very good word uh, to, to look at and the word should be actually I am not coming. But then grammar only points out uh, legal sentences, it only uh, looks for legal sentences and it is a rule of the game, rule of a conversation, but it never looks at or it never tells you whether a sentence is uh, good English or good Hindi or a good language, right. So, grammar will tell you whether a sentence is following a certain rule or not or does it uh, is it correct in terms of rules, in terms of sentence construction, whether the constraint sentence construction rules are following in a comprehension or in a conversation, but it will not tell you, tell you whether this is the correct way to speak. So, grammar does not do that and that is what grammars are all about. Now, psychologist and psycholinguist they distinguish between something called the explicit and implicit knowledge of linguistic rule. The idea is how do people know? rules of grammar. How do people, what is the way in which people know the rules of grammar or how do they grab these rules? Is it explicit? Are we, ex uh, do we know when we look at a sentence that we are following certain rule? What is the grammar of it? So, grammatical rules, how do they work? Are they explicit or implicit in nature? So, although most of us cannot state with accuracy the rules of English syntax, but we can basically find out ambiguities in sentences. So, if there is a violation of grammar, we can find into it. For example, look at the sentence, uh, ran the dog, street down cat, after yellow the very the. What does it really mean? It does not mean anything and so if you give them, give somebody who has studied the English language, he will find out that this is a problem, there is a problem with something in the sentence and then if you ask them to correct, this is probably what they are going to write back. So, people although they do not know the explicit rules, if, the, if you ask somebody who knows English or studied little bit of English, they will immediately say that this sentence is wrong, is somehow wrong, it is not grammatically correct. Ask them the grammar rule, they are not able to do it, but ask them to transform this and this is the transformation that most people are going to do. They say that the dog ran down the street after the very yellow cat and this is the exact interpretation right. So, grammatically this is incorrect, but most people are able to correct it all that you do not know how this grammar really comes in. And so, people's uh, knowledge about grammar is mostly implicit. So, our knowledge of rules of grammar is therefore, not explicit. We often use something called prescriptive rules uh, uh, example what people say should follow. So, when we are using or when we talk or when we use language, we generally use something called prescriptive rules which tells us how we should talk or write. There are certain prescriptive rules, there are certain rules which uh, goes around the world which people share between us in saying how you should talk and how you should not. For example, if you are saying I ain't, I am uh, what you are doing, this kind of sentences are not uh, uh, permitted or not uh, uh, entertained and so this is the prescriptive rule. Now, in contrast, the articulation of descriptive rule characteristics of a sentence are very hard. So, what people tend to do is they know prescriptive rules of using grammar when they when they are conversing they know what is wrong and what is right, but they do not know what is it in the grammatical uh, way what is wrong or what is right. And so, as I said as I showed to you that if these two sentences are shown to people, people will be immediately able to tell you that the first sentence is something somewhere wrong and the second sentence is right, this is the right format of it, but they would not be able to tell you where the problem is or what the grammatical problem is. And so, looking at in terms of grammatical is called the descriptive rule and prescriptive rule how they can do it or how they are able to tell there is a problem is because they use something called prescriptive rules of how a language should be studied or how a language should follow. 
So, basically then this is how the structure of a language is it starts with something called phonemes goes up to something called morphemes then there is the level of the word then there is from the word there is something called the syntax which is the meaning of a language which is the structure of a language from the syntax there is a meaning generated which is studied through something called semantics and semantics is basically uh, the meaning of a language but even if a language or even if a sentence has meaning it may not be the best way to communicate and so ways of communication is called pragmatics and from this pragmatics mathematics the certain grammar follows this is how uh, the language is looked uh, or uh, made into. Now, let us look at one by one these structures. So, the first structure that we discuss is called the phones or the phonology. Now, if you look at German and if you look at French and if you look at English you will see that most of them are uh, different languages. Why German is a very hard language for example, somebody speaking German would say and Schuldigum or something like very uh, in, in a very um, Bisrein of Wiedersehen which are very strong. So, Germans are known to be very strong language. If you look at French uh, which is more of a subtle language more of a uh, likable language people will be speaking in terms of um, uh, uh, some soft languages for example, we or we or um, some other some other way of in which I do not know French, French but it is a very soft language. Look at English it is more easier. So, hello, hi kind of a thing. So, these languages why is German a hard language or a very strong language and French a uh, uh, very soft language or or uh, au revoir for example, is a word in French which basically means that uh, goodbye. Uh, so, or la femme, la femme for uh, people for men and women. So, it is soft in nature and English is just gender. So, how does these differences arise? The differences arise because the speech sound, the idiosyncratic speech sounds in these languages are different. The basic sounds are very different and so phonetics is basically the study of speech sounds and how they are produced and phonology is the state a systematic ways of uh, integrating these speech sounds uh, and uh, how altering this uh, speech sounds for converting the language. So, basically phonology is the study of speech sounds of different languages and these speech sounds of how they are combined together, how they are altered, how they are spoken basically defines how a language is treated whether it is a soft language, hard language and so on and so forth. Now, for the English language there are 40 phonetic segments, there are 40 phonetic segments which are there and these phonetic segments are called the phonemes. So, what are phonemes? These phonemes are the speech sound as we discussed in, in the beginning of this chapter the idea of phonetic uh, languages is in terms of phonemes in terms of the phones which is the basic speech sound. So, phones are the basic smallest unit of a sound that make a meaningful difference for example, a, e, u, te, d these are sounds which are phones now in a given language. Now, in one phone the phoneme of a word is exchanged for another and so I will show you that how important they are because if I replace one phoneme with the other phoneme in a sentence then it could it would mean differently and so here is an example if I replace the D phoneme D phoneme with the T phoneme in a language then that leads to the duck becoming the tuck right and so you see the difference. So, if I replace one phoneme one speech sound or one basic sound in English language the D is replaced by a T the duck becomes a tuck and so duck has a meaning tuck does not have also tuck has a meaning in, in some way, but then it is not the same thing and so these differences can arise and D and T are more or less nearby and they create something called semantic uh, or uh, they create something called uh, uh, acoustic confusion. We have seen acoustic confusion as one reason of encoding in uh, semantic memory and so this is what happens. So, this is a list of uh, IPA list of different phonemes and so you can go uh, through these. So, these are the number of vowels which are there and these are number of consonants which are there and these are the phonemes for it. So, if you look into the vowel these are the phonemes for it, this is the number of consonants and these are the phonemes for it and this is how the example is. For example, the uh, A as in cat, the A as in arm, the A in, in away and so on and so forth. Now, the psychologist or psycholinguist they distinguish between a consonant and a vowel. What is the difference between a consonant and a vowel? Now, the English language 
uh, in terms of the phonemes they have something called a consonant and they have something called a vowel. Now, what is the difference between a consonant and a vowel? Now, vowels generally they work without obstructing the air flow. So, when you produce a vowel the air flow is not obstructed in any way and simply depending on the shape of the position of the tongue a vowel is, uh, is, is produced. So, there is no obstruction of the air flow for example, when you say a, a, e, i, o, u it is the change on the mouth the change of the uh, on, on the lips which is basically producing the sound and there is no obstruction of the, uh, the air flow. Whereas, in a consonants the consonants are phonemes which are made by closing at least one part of the mouth they differ in. So, basically consonants require obstruction of air flow and vowels does not require obstruction of air flow. For example, when we say the word b, c, k, t all of them require that the air which is flowing from the diagram up, the air which is coming from the diagram up, it is blocked in some way in the mouth and this is what is the consonant is. Now, the way a consonant is looked at the kind of uh, obstruction of the air flow which is generated for producing a consonant can happen at 4 places now or it depends on 4 factors. First the uh, uh, place of articulation, where is the obstruction? So, where is the obstruction of the air flow occurring? For example, B and P sound appears by closing the lips. Try saying B with open lips, it is not possible. So, we that happens. So, when we say B or P, it happens by obstructing the air flow by closing the lips. Similarly, the S and the Z sound made by placing the tongue against the hard pellet. So, say S without pushing the your tongue towards the upper part of the hard pellet towards this part of the mouth, this part of the mouth say S, say S without putting your tongue here. S not happening, Z not happening and so this is what it is and so, so putting the tongue or putting the your tongue at the roof of the uh, uh, of, of the mouth of, of the hard palate is how uh, the uh, S and Z sounds are produced. The other way or the other factor is the manner of articulation. What is the mechanism for obstructing the air flow? For example, the word M sounds by closing the mouth while opening the nasal cavity. So, say M and do not close the mouth say M not happening or try not using the nasal cavity M not happening. So, that is the problem here. Similarly, the sound obstruction of the air for producing a hissing sound. So, for example, F F is produced F is produced by this hissing sound or, or this this mechanism of our flow or uh, air flow or the mechanism of the hissing the after sound which is there it produces the F. The third factor uh, which differentiates a consonant or which happen which makes it possible for a consonant to occur is called the voicing. So, what is voicing? Voicing is vibration of the vocal cord. How does the vibration of the vocal cord happens? Now, for example, uh, uh, the word S does not require the vocal cord to uh, touch a vocal cord and, and look into it. If, if I say S there is no vibration, but if I say Z there is a vibration out there and so these vibrations of the vocal cord are also the ways of producing a particular um, uh, vowel. And so, these are the ways in which a vowel or consonant is produced and I said the basic difference is in vowels there is no obstruction of air flow whereas, in a consonant there is obstruction of air flow whether it is the level of uh, the mechanism of air flow or the type of mouth movement which makes the air flow or uh, uh, the kind of vibration of the vocal cord. And as you see this is basically the mouth positions for producing the vowel and the consonant. And I think I say it is a funny uh, thing here. So, um, to, to show how vowels and consonants are uh, different. Now, features of phonemes are involved in certain phonological rules or govern the ways in which phonemes are combined. And so, these ways in which these phonemes are combined they give rise to certain phonological rules. Now, there are two there are some rules which are followed in English language. For example, if two true consonants are in the beginning of an English language if a English language or if a word in an English language starts with two true consonants then the first must be an S and this is one rule which is out there and this rule makes D top or Mikish not possible right. And so, if we have two consonants B and K in, in terms of uh, the start of a uh, uh, sentence or start of a word in English language the first the rule says that two true consonants uh, first has to be an S and that is how it is and that is why you do not make the top, but you make stop 
or mikish or skish as being the legal words. Now, these combinations of phonological rules of how phones are there, it gives to certain rules and one of the rule is the use of the two consonant rule. And the other is this is how to pronounce uh, uh, plurals or pronounce a plural happen in the English also. So, basically these phones, these phonetic rules also tell you how pronunciation of plurals happens in English language. For example, if a word ends with uh, the z, the, uh, the s, the z, the c or s or j or z, then the plural uh, is always in the, ten, uh, in the terms of a z. For example, plays, the plural is places, porch, it is porches. Right? But if the word ending is in terms of p, t, k and f, the plural is always in terms of an s. And so, these are certain rules which have been uh, given, there are certain rules which are out there which says uh, how these phones that we talked about or the, how these verbs, uh, verbals and consonants that we talked about, how they are allowed to mix together and follow a or make up a uh, morpheme or make up a word. Right. So, if we have this PTK, the ending is always Z uh, in terms of S. For example, lip will not have lips, it will have lips as an ending because it is ending in a P or if it in terms of telegraph, uh, it is ending in a T, the uh, plural is always in uh, terms of a telegraph. But if anything else uh, beside these number which I have shown here, the plural will always be in terms of Z. So, basically these are the special ones which are there. So, that will give to an S. Uh, ending. Other than that, you would have the uh, Z ending. For example, club, it will be clubs, herd, herds kind of a thing. So, why are different language sounds uh, different? Why are different languages, they sound different to us? First, they contain different sounds or different phonemes. As I said, German has different phonemes. For example, uh, in German, you have um, G uh, or uh, A, B, C, D, E, F. A, B, C, D, E, G kind of a thing or you have uh, things like uh, V and F, the Fata, F and W is, is uh, what is looked into and so different sounds are there. Similarly, you have French, Spanish and the each one of them has a different sound and so they appear differently. They have different rules of combining these sounds for example, Fata and water, water and fata in, in German. So, uh, V is pronounced as V in, in this case and so this is pronounced as F. So, when we say father, they uh, put fata into how it is or schwester in, in this sense uh, for sister. So, basically different sounds are there and so this different sounds and this uh, combination of different sounds are the two reasons why a German sounds different from uh, the English language right. So, different phones and different ways of combining or any language for example, it could be French, it could be uh, Spanish, it could be um, uh, Chinese, Mandarin, any language you look into, there are certain rules of combining these. There are certain, first of all, there are certain speech sounds and the certain ways or rules of combining these speech sounds which make them, which makes two languages different. The next interesting thing to look into or the next part of a sentence or next part of a language is syntax. So, what is syntax? It is an arrangement of words within a sentence. How words are arranged into a particular sentence or the structure of a sentence. Uh, now, what does syntax do? It tells you the ways in which different words or larger phrase can be combined to from legal sentences in a language. For example, what syntax does? It tells you how words should be arranged in, in a sentence and what is the arrangement of words and then it tells you what is legal and what is not. What arrangement produces legal sentences and what arrangement does not produce legal arrangement. And for example, the SVO subject object verb kind of a thing subject word object I am sorry SVO format or uh, the subject verb object time format which basically tells you what should come before that. So, a uh, subject should be always followed by a verb in English and then an object. Right? And so, in English Ram is going to the village is ok, uh, but in Hindi uh, uh, Ram ghar jata hai or ghar jata hai Ram is also correct and so I can make these transpositions, I can make this movement. But then this is this allowance of movements in terms of German also, this allowance of movements is there for certain parts of the sentence can move, but in terms of uh, village goes to Ram is not correct. Why? Because this movement is not allowed and so this movement or this kind of changes is what syntax is. Syntax are rules which says what uh, in which way the words could be combined to form meaningful sentences. 
Now, to explain what does the structure of a sentence mean, consider the following. For example, look at this sentence the dog chased the squirrel in the park. Now, if I look into it, it is in the correct sentence and it has meanings. Now, if I break this sentence, this is the level of the sentence. At the level of the sentence, if I break it, it has two different parts. Now, uh, uh, refer to the first figure which I showed you. It has something called a noun phrase and a verb phrase and within the noun phrase, then you have certain other structures which are there. There is something called a determinant and there is something called a first noun and the is called the determinant which is determining the noun which is the dog. So, the dog, which dog? That particular dog. If I just say dog, then it is not referring to it. The determinant is there and so, dog could be anything, but then I say the dog chase the squirrel which means that I am referring to a particular dog. Similarly, in the verb phrase, I have then a different arrangement altogether. I have the verb which connects. So, it is S V O format as you look into it. This is the subject, this is the verb and this is the object which is then. So, object has certain data minus into it. We will come back to that in a minute. Then this is my subject, this is my verb. So, what does the dog do? The word dog chases, it is chasing down that is the, uh, the, the uh, action that this particular verb is doing and then I have uh, another uh, uh, thing which is called the object here. So, the squirrel now so why determinant here? The determinant is because it is squaring, it is chasing a particular squirrel. Now, dog chase the squirrel, which means that dog chase can chase any squirrel. But if I am looking referring to a particular dog, referring to a particular uh, squirrel, then I have the the in bit, the determiner for it, and so the dog chases the squirrel. This could be a sentence, but since this sentence has more parts of it, it has something called uh, uh, this part, which is the noun phrase here. The park, where does it chase the squirrel? It chases the squirrel in the park, and so this is a, a uh, advanced combination here or it is another part of the sentence. And so, this is this particular thing of breaking a sentence into its parts of the noun phrase and the verb phrase and within the noun phrase how the verb and the noun acts in, in into or how they are divided into is what is called uh, the, the semantics. I am sorry the syntax. Now, the diagram shows a label diagram tree and depicts what is called the categorical constituents of a sentence. So, syntax is basically what words are combined and how they are combined and so this basically uh, what we saw is how a syntax actually looks into. Now, these changes explain why certain changes are so this kind of uh, categorical arrangement explains why certain uh, are in, uh, certain movements of sentences are allowable and certain movements are not allowable and this uh, uh, taking certain part of a sentence for example, and this part of the sentence for example, I can very well take this and put it here and make this change from here to here. So, the, uh, the squirrel chases the dog in the park is perfectly correct syntactical sentence. Although it has wrong semantics in terms of meaning it is wrong, but perfectly okay. So, I can I can take a noun phrase and move it uh, uh, along along this structure, along this constraint structure and that is called preposing. So, that is what which, which is. So, this categorical arrangement, this syntactical arrangement or constraint arrangement basically helps you in preposing, taking certain parts of a sentence and moving it in front of the others uh, and that it also tells why I can make the squirrel move from here or the park move from here, but I cannot uh, take the chase and move it into the front of a sentence. So, what can be moved and what cannot be moved or how can changes for example, I can very well say that the park chases the squirrel in the dog right and that is perfectly legal in terms of the syntax, but in semantics it has no meaning at all and so this is what is allowed and this is not what is allowed because syntax looks at meaning and so this constraint structure, this tree structure then tells me what can be moved and what cannot be and this movement of part of a sentence toward the front or back of a sentence is called preposing. For example, look at the two sentences, so my naughty dog I am mad at is not legal whereas naughty dog I am mad, mad at my uh, is not legal. So, my naughty dog I am mad at is perfectly legal, but if I try to prepose something out of here or I want to take this and uh, put it here, then it is not legal at all. Similarly, that inflated price I will not pay is perfectly legal, but if I try to uh, prepose something for example, you try to prepose price, price I will not pay that inflated is not legal. The inflated price I will not pay is perfectly legal and so this kind of constraint structure or uh, uh, tree structure tells you or tells someone using a language of what is possible and what is not possible. 
Now, how do we uh, concisely summarize what can and what can't be legal uh, 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 proposed structure or what can be uh, uh, the way of making a legal sentence. And so, one of the ways is that one of the rule is that only whole phrases can be moved. You cannot move part of the sentences or part of a uh, particular sentence from one position to another. Also, uh, there is something called the phase structure rule which says that or rewrite describes the way in which certain symbols can be rewritten. So, uh, what happens here is that it says that certain symbols can be rewritten in a certain way and so if it moves something with it or certain uh, I can rewrite a particular symbol into some other symbol and that way I can make the preposition I can make the movement. Similarly, there is something called the transformation rule which says that uh, structures such as those depicted in tree diagrams onto other structure example preposing. And so, this rule says that some structures can be moved and some structures cannot be and what can be transformed and what cannot be transformed. So, there are certain rules out there for example, one rule is that the only whole phrases can be moved and then the other is a phase structure rule which says that certain structures in a sentence can again be rewritten or broken down into other structures and that decides what can be moved or not and there is a transformation rule which says that what can be moved and what cannot be moved and that says how sentence can make meaning or how can a legal sentence be formed. And so, as you look into it, Mr. Parkey had a problem with his sentence and that can create problems. For example, it says work for will work as food. Now, as food which basically means that he will be eaten up right and so that is a problem which says will work for food could be the right thing. Now, the next part of what we look into is called the semantics. So, we looked at syntax the rule of it and semantics is making meaning. So, semantics is basically the study of meaning and plays an important role in language. In any, any language a meaning has to be there and if the meaning is not there then there is a problem. So, although there is no complete theory of meaning as, as of now and there are uh, there is uh, attempts to make a universal theory of meaning which, uh, which captures everything, but then uh, uh, Burswich in 1970 he says that any theory of meaning should have or should be able to explain several uh, things at a minimum. So, any theory of meaning any semantic rule should be able to explain certain kind of deviations or certain kind of factors which is there. First of all any theory of meaning should be able to point out anomaly any theory of meaning should be able to tell why and what kind of anomaly is uh, prescribed in a certain language. For example, why can't I say coffee ice creams can take dictation? Why is this an anomaly? The, uh, the reason is any theory of meaning, any semantic rule should be able to point out why is this not a legal sentence coffee ice creams can take dictation, right? So, basically because it does not make meaning because coffee ice creams are not human since they cannot take dictation and the very idea of dictation is that it is something which uh, which is moving which can hear a conversation and these cannot take an invention. So, this is an anomaly. Similarly, self contradiction any theory of meaning any semantic uh, rule should also be able to point out self contradiction in sentences. For example, uh, when I say my dog is not an animal why it is self contradictory because it is an animal right when I say it is uh, my uh, my dog is so and so people try to give them name this is basically self contradictory because most dogs are animal and so you cannot create them or say that this is not an animal. Also things like ambiguity why is not it clear when where one intends to go when I say I need to go to the bank. So, said theories of meaning should also be able to point out this kind of problem this kind of ambiguity when I say I am going to the bank it is not very clear when I am going until unless a context is in before it or after it. For example, I am, I am trying to tell you about a situation or about uh, my visit to some uh, to, to some water body or some ocean or some nice place and then I am trying to say that I am going to the bank then it has some meaning. So, basically then any theory of meaning should be able to explain these kind of ambiguities. Also synonymities and uh, any theory of meaning should also be able to uh, uh, explain why synonymity or how synonymity exists. For example, when I say the rabbit is not old enough how does it mean the same as rabbit is too young? When I say not old enough how does it mean or what does it mean or what is uh, how is it translated to the fact that it is too young. So, any theory of meaning should be able to also comprehend that or should also be able to explain how does this happen. And the last is called the entailment uh, uh, which is uh, when I say that Pat is my uncle, how does it automatically generate this fact that Pat is a male? Because uncle is a male and so Pat is a male that kind of a rule. So, any theory of meaning should be able to do that. Now, when listeners they figure out meaning of a sentence they need to pay attention to more than just the meaning of individual words. If you do not do that what will happen is the 
meaning would change. So, although the sentence would have the same semantics, it will have the correct format, but meanings would change. And so, if you look into the, these two sentences, the professor failed the student and the student failed the professor, they have entirely two different meaning into it. And so, any theory of meaning should be able to explain why this happened. Because when I say the professor failed the student, it is basically failing in an exam. But when I say the student failed the professor, it is basically not failing the professor in an exam, but basically because that is not possible and that is the theory of meaning. It says that this is not possible. So, the students do not take an exam and so this is the how the world runs and so when the student fail the exam it is basically failing him in terms of certain uh, uh, values in terms of certain uh, facts certain uh, trust that the professor had. So, he failed the, the student failed the professor in terms of trust whereas when the professor failed the student he failed in terms of an academic value or an academic exam. Now, the study of semantics also involves the study of truth conditions. So, for uh, any sentence to be true, when I am doing a sentence, when I am looking at a sentence, uh, the, uh, the theory of or the study of semantics or the study of uh, semantic rules should also be able to point out whether a sentence is true or not, because truth conditions often decide uh, whether a sentence uh, exists or what is the meaning of a sentence and the relationship between different sentences that it has. So, truth conditions are simply circumstances that make something true. For example, the dog chase the cat is a true sentence, but the cat chase the dog is not in terms of truth conditions is not valid because cats do not chase dog in normal meaning. And so, any uh, idea of meaning or any uh, uh, sentence or semantics or any sentence which has uh, uh, sentences like the cat chase the dog is entirely wrong. Although this kind of meaning can generate in an animation movie, but normally saying the dog will only chase the cat and so this is the truth condition. Hence, our understanding of meaning of a sentence is requires some steps the, and our, our ways or how we understand meaning from sentences, they are bound by certain variables, certain factors and understanding of the meaning of each word or sentence. So, how you make meaning from a sentence or how you make meaning from a word, a comprehension or text passage is basically by understanding the meaning of each word that it has. Uh, remember the professor failed the student, the student failed the professor. So, looking at the word, looking at meaning from each word, you can and then say that professor failing the student is an exam in an exam, but student failing the professor is in terms of trust. So, there it is academic, there it is trust. So, our understanding of meaning it relies on understanding uh, the meaning of each word, understanding the syntax of the sentence. So, whether the syntax is correct or not, whether the grammatical rule is correct or not, and understanding the truth conditions. So, how do we generate meaning? We generate meaning by understanding each word from or understanding the meaning of each word a sentence has. Next thing that we do is we look at the syntax and we understand the syntax. If the syntax is wrong, then the meaning will not be generated out of it because the sentence will not be correct. And the third thing is we also look at whether in terms of the world view, whether the sentence is true or not. So, uh, the dog chase, the, the cat chase the dog each word has a meaning, the dog has a meaning, the cat has a meaning, the chase has a meaning. Also the syntax is correct because there is a subject, verb and object. But in terms of truth conditions, the fact that normally seeing the cats cannot chase dogs or do not chase dogs, that basically establishes the fact that it is in terms of truth conditions, it is false. Now, we looked at semantics which is the meaning of a sentence. The next thing that we are going to look at is pragmatics which is basically the social rules of how language should be spoken or what are the etiquettes and of conversations which are out there. So, basically in pragmatics we, we look at uh, uh, the sentences what is the way, what is the social way of conversing, what is the required etiquettes which have. So, uh, basically for example, uh, good pragmatics is saying uh, uh, conversational greetings uh, like saying hi how are you if somebody says you have to reply to him in a certain way. So, if somebody says hi how are you and you say um, something which is very rude that is not a good pragmatics. So, pra pragmatics are certain rules of language or certain rules of conversation. So, although your sentence would make meaning, but how they should be conversed, how people should be conversing with the sentences that you are making is what is the study of uh, pragmatics. So, Sarle in 1979, he points out that in listening to another person, we must understand the kinds of utterances that they demand in different responses to us. So, Sarle says that there are certain sentences, certain the sentences which have been uttered, which are uttered by people and all these sentences have different kind of responses and we should as a listener not only be able to understand the kind of sentence that a person is uh, speaking, we should also be able to give a reply befitting the uh, kind of sentence which has been asked. For example, one of uh, the ways or uh, uh, one of the particular 
uh, uh, ways of communication is called the assertive sentence. Now, in assertive sentence, the speaker, his or her, he asserts his belief. For example, words like it's hot in here. I am a Gemini. It doesn't require any kind of response. So, somebody is just asserting something or saying something. Now, there are directives uh, which people uh, go ahead and speak and these directives are instruction and so you should be replying in similar to it. For example, the speaker uh, uh, saying to a listener saying close the door or do not trust him. When I say close the door, it requires an action from the listener and so that is the kind of thing it is and so you do not need to speak anything. When somebody says close the door, you close the door and I say do not trust him, you do not say anything to it, you basically have to listen to it and act upon it. Then there is something called commusives. These are utterances that commit the speaker to some later action. For example, I promise to be good. Now, which basically says that the speaker is promising or it is basically he is telling the, the listener that in future he is going to do something. For example, being good or uh, if somebody says I will be a wingman which means that this person is going to help the other person. And so, this requires certain other kind of responses than the directives. In an expressive describe psychological states. For example, uh, uh, in an expressive you do not really know what to do. So, you have to read to it. For example, I say that I thank you for the favor you did to me. This is an expressive sentence. This is a expression of thanks. Now, I do not know what you could be doing with it, but this is an expressive. For example, if I say thank you for nothing, this is an uh, psychological state of the speaker. And so, you should be responding in a similar way as against a directive or a commissive sentence. And the last is declarations are speech acts in which the utterances uh, itself are the actions. Now, in these cases, the sentences which are speak, uh, spoken are itself certain actions. For example, I now pronounce you husband and wife. This basically says that there are certain action into it. The act itself, the fact itself that my pronouncing makes you husband and wife is true or sentences like you are so dead are basically an utterance. It is a declaration and the sentence itself declare a particular fact onto it and so people should be hanging around to it. Now, according to Saturday's speech act theory, part of a job of a listener is to figure out which of the five particular utterances are there and to respond utterly. So, basically it is not only understanding the meaning, the structure of a sentence and so on and so forth. It is basically a we go a level ahead of it and then we also look at how people talk to each other and how do they generate sentences. For example, best example of pragmatics look, look at the two figures. Now, in the first case uh, Sherlock saw the man using binoculars which means that he used the binoculars for seeing the man and in the other case Sherlock saw the man using the binoculars. In the second case he saw the man who was using a binoculars and so this is the difference between pragmatics or this is the difference between how sentences are. So, both are the same sentence, same legal constraints, same structure, same meaning, but the pragmatics of to it or uh, that is not what I meant when I ask you to carve it. So, what he has done is he has carved something out of it and so the subject meaning. So, basically the idea of how a sentence should be uh, really constructed. So, in this class in this particular lecture what I tried to do is I tried to show to you what is language, what is the meaning of language, what are the different constraints of a language and basically then we went ahead and looked at each con uh, constituent one by one and how do they um, uh, play their role into the language itself or the working of the language itself. Now, in the upcoming section we look into how speech is produced when a speech is uh, how people utter languages and what are the confusions and problems in utterance of these languages. So, in the first part we looked at parts of a language and how they are combined together to form the language itself. The second part so it is in terms of rules and structures and so on and so forth. In the last in the next part that we will talk we will talk about errors in production of speech or how speech is produced in itself and several factors related to that. So, let us meet in the next class and discuss this. Thank you.